Um, I'm Daniel Sitanayake, and um, I'm going to be the moderator for today's session. I'd like to thank all of the sponsors for our Tiny ML Talks series. Um, so we have DeepLight, Kixo, Edge Impulse, Reality AI, and Maxim Integrated, and Syncense. And I'm actually the founding Tiny ML engineer at Edge Impulse. So I'm super, super happy to be presenting here today. Um, we'd also like to uh, thank our strategic partner, Arm, who's supporting the whole Tiny ML Talks initiative. So thank you very much, Arm. Our next talks, which are going to be on Tuesday, November 10th, are from Esan Sabori, who's co-founder and CTO of DeepLight, um, and Alexander Samuelson, who's CTO and co-founder of Imagimob. So that's going to be really awesome. Um, please tune in, same time, Tuesday, November 10th. We are also um, hosting our Tiny ML Asia online summit on November 16th to 19th. So we have currently a call for video posters out. So if you have a poster you'd like to present, um, abstract to do October 31st. And you can check out the full program at tinyml.org at this URL. So um, please, uh, please check that out if you are in Asia. Without further ado, I'd like um, to introduce Chris and Robert from Maxim Integrated. So their talk is going to be cu cutting the AI power cord, technology to enable true edge inference. So Chris is the um, business lead and Robert is the tech lead for Maxim Integrated. And I will let you both take it from here. Great, thanks Daniel. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Chris Artis. Um, I'm in the uh, microcontroller security and software business unit at Maxim. Uh, as Daniel mentioned, I'm the business lead for our new, uh, our new processors with AI acceleration and Robert's the technical lead. Um, Robert's going to do the bulk of the talking, uh, but what we're here to talk about today is our new Mac 78,000 uh, processor, which has a, a dedicated neural network accelerator. Uh, and with that, we've achieved orders of magnitude, uh, lower energy and latency uh, than other solutions we see for the embedded, uh, embedded AI market. So we're going to talk a little bit about that processor and actually how we've achieved that. Uh, so just to kind of kick things off real quick for, for Robert, uh, I think we all are here because we see this AI or machine learning revolution underway and we all, we all see these big machines uh, like cars participating in that. Uh, but what we're really interested in is trying to uh, close a gap between what these big machines that from my perspective as an embedded person, you know, have infinite cost and infinite power budgets, you know, like a car. Uh, or, or something running in the cloud. Um, you know, and those things can do powerful inferencing jobs like, you know, like vision, but the smaller devices on the right can't really do that today. I think that's probably why we're all here um, in, in this form is to try to enhance the abilities of the devices on the right to move beyond things like simple wake words and be able to implement things like vision uh, in those types of applications. I'm going to take over since the business guy seems to have trouble with the technology. So in, in the embedded world, we're going to, at some point in the future, probably are going to see learning on the embedded device. But right now, uh, our main concern is to do, uh, to do inference in an embedded device. Like if you have a low cost thing like a remote control right now, and it's going to be coming, but right now, you know, you'd be very happy if it could do just an inference. So in this particular discussion, we're not going to talk embedded learning. We're just going to talk about inference, which means forward propagation. And we have a history of ultra low power microcontrollers. And so at first, of course, you'll be tempted to try to implement that in an existing micro because they are cheap, they're plentiful. Uh, we understand them very well, but even the best algorithms, you know, that not only do they do a lot of math, but there, with every math piece, there comes a lot of memory access. So let's just assume we're not even using floating point anymore. Let's say we're doing int and we get the best algorithms out there, um, O of n to the 2.8. That's still a lot of memory back and forth that has to be done. So in the end, it probably doesn't really work out except for very, very small little examples. But if you wanna do vision or even speech or some complicated time series things, 
the embedded micro is probably not going to do it. So, you know, we were sitting there and all we had was the embedded micro. And so we started working on something new. And of course, since this field moves so fast as everybody knows in this group, we have to be a lot better to make a difference. We can't justify the investment and then, you know, it's, it's double or, or, or four times as, as good because somebody will have come up with something by the time we're done, that's even better. So it has to make a difference. So we said, okay, our number one goal is energy and with that also latency. And it has to be at least a hundred or a thousand times better than what we have, which is a pretty good low power microcontroller with ARM core and it has its own DSP inside. And that really we think will enable AI at the edge. We also think that we can't pick one or two applications at this point. So we need to have something that's application agnostic that will support all the things that people haven't thought of. Um, if you think that maybe half of future software will be some way machine learning based, you can't just say, okay, I'm, I'm going to put in just one accelerator for one type of application. For one thing, it may not be that we figured out what the best way to do this is yet. But for the other thing is there's so many other applications that haven't been thought of or that people are working on yet. So it needs to be somewhat programmable and application agnostic. So our take on this is the Max 78,000. And on the left side, it's a low power micro like we've done for a long time. So it has an ARM core, it has a RISC-V core, DMA, everything, all the memory, everything is on board. So it has built-in non-volatile memory to hold all the parameters, to hold its software, it has built-in RAM for the ARM micro to function. It has built-in power supply, power management, security, clocks, all the external interfaces that you would usually want on an embedded micro. So that's the left side. And it's about half of the die area. The other half is something completely new that we came up with. So it's not an instantiation of something that's avail available anywhere else. And it has a lot of memory itself. I highlighted those in green. Um, it's a massively parallel CNN accelerator. So massively parallel in, in our world, 64 processing units. And it can do, depending on how you count it, 32 to 64 layers, up to 1,024 channels in each layer. And the data dimensions, and we're gonna talk about this a little more. So without any tricks, you can do about 180 by 180. And if you use our tricks, you can get higher. And I would say, realistically speaking, maybe a BGA frame it can digest without having any external memory. In We'll get to why that's important to us. So I think one additional thing that's important to add here is that the, the, the neural network accelerator runs independently of microcontroller assistance. Uh, so really, you know, from my perspective, the microcontroller's jobs here are to get data from the outside world to the accelerator, tell the accelerator to go, and then do something with the result. The accelerator runs completely independently, so we're really able to uh, optimize that uh, architecture for energy efficiency. Right, so um, there is a question in the, in the Q&A. CNN is convolutional neural network. We should have spelled that out. So I apologize for that. So here's the die plot. We always have that. That's like uh, for, for hardware guys, that's always like the, the money shot is the die plot. Um, and again, you can see the division at the top. Also, you'll see four regions. We'll mention those later. And on the right side is a top level view of the accelerator. And it really, it's, it's a state machine that digests data, runs it through processing units while trying to minimize data movement and writes out its results. And that happens over and over and over again. So the hardware state machine, and like Chris said, the, the micro is there to feed it and to take its results and do something with it. Also, sometimes you have to do something with your input data be before you can feed it to a CNN accelerator. You might have to precondition the inputs or collect them from an interface or something. So micros are really good for that because they're fully programmable. 
once you fed them to the accelerator, um, the accelerator can do by trying to minimize its data movement, it can do in-flight cooling, element-wise operations, and then the big deal is the convolution operation that it does to the data. Writes out the data to its internal memories and the next layer will pick up that output and run it again up to 32 times. So that's really the key to think about this. So it's not like doing this using a software interpreter where you can add new operations when or oper operators when you think of a new one. So we had to, a, half an, a year and a half ago or something, we had to say, okay, this is it. And the next slide will show what that is. We have to pick a reasonable subset. Those are going to be super fast, um, but the trade-off is what's not in hardware uh, will not be in this device, right? You'd have to emulate it in slow software or wait for our next device that may have it at some point, because of course we're not standing still. This is a family. I, I bolded some of these uh, to highlight. So uh, 2D convolutions and up to three by three kernels. If you want bigger, um, you would have to use a sequence of the three by three kernels that should be about the same mathematically speaking. 1D we support um, flatten operations linear, which is just a subset of the 2D convolution. Um, one thing that we wanted to mention here specifically is that on a per layer basis, while all the weights are integer, you can pick how, how wide the weights are supposed to be. So you can choose one, two, four, and eight bit weights. And the data is always eight bit. And then we added something that after the big accumulation operation, which uses an internal large um, accumulator, you can shift that result before the activation and before it's clipped back to eight bits. So that allows us to do things like um, uh, batch norm or even um, quantization aware training. We use that feature. The RISC V core that you may have seen earlier, uh, we like RISC V. Um, we use that in the same clock and power domain as the CNN because we were thinking, okay, so there's so many different ways that data could be handled and you may want to flip bits, you may want to reorder. There's an infinite number. And if you wanted to put all of these operations into a DMA, I think you will find that you might as well just have a processor. So we used one that's small and low power, that RISC-V, and we put it in the same clock and power domain as the accelerator. So now we use the RISC-V as our smart DMA, which is nicely programmable and it can do everything um, that you might want to do with your data on the input and the output side. And then the streaming mode of which we'll talk later a little bit more. So after we implement it in a test ship, um, we implemented this accelerator. We noticed really soon that we take out the energy out of the convolutional operations. <laughs> you still have the data input and the data manipulation and to a lesser degree, the data output that consume energy. And the right side, these are not made up bars. I mean, yes, it, it uh, hits the ceiling there and would want to go on, um, but so we're at the point where data manipulation and data input could be more energy than the convolution. So we implemented some features for that in our hardware as well to help with that. And we're going to click, yes. We're going to highlight a few of them. Um, this is the same block diagram that we showed earlier. It just shows in green um, measures that we took to reduce energy elsewhere that's not in the accelerator. And then in yellow, that's more of a crisp business kind of thing. Some of the additional features that we added there to support a wider variety of networks. And we're gonna talk about three improvements specifically. So one, we added FIFOs. Um, the memories that we use, and you may have seen that, uh, I've been harping about memories for quite a bit. Memory movement is one of the most expensive operations that you can do, so reading and writing memory. So we try to minimize that. And memory is also a big cost, which Chris really cares about. So we use in single port memories and with a single port, only one entity can access it at the same time. So that's kind of bad if you wanna feed in new data, but you're also trying to do the math with it. So we added these FIFOs 
that allow us to feed in new data while the accelerator is actually running. And again, we have two different kinds here. One's optimized just for the risk five. Uh, we call that the fast FIFO because it avoids going through an asynchronous bridge. It's really fa much faster than the other ones that the arm could access. And then this thing has so many power saving modes that you know, would be an its own talk just to talk about those. One, it's highly modular, so you can turn off three quarters of the accelerator if your network is smaller. And we call them quadrants because there are four of them in this incarnation of the accelerator. So the third thing and the last improvement I wanna talk about is streaming. And to set this up is, if you look at data sizes that you have, let's just say a humble VGA frame, which is not much to us anymore, but it's still a lot of data. That VGA would take three and a half megabytes. But when you run it through a neural network, the intermediate data might be much, much bigger. So if you, if you were to say, we have 128 channels of a VGA frame, you're at 38 megabytes and we cannot put that in our technology. There's no way to have that embedded on chip. You would have to go to external memory, which is so costly that you might as well um, build a completely different device, not what we are trying to do in deeply embedded, low cost, low power. So the streaming takes advantage of the fact that when you get something from an image sensor, it's really scanned row by row. So you have this natural delivery of your data. And you'd also observe that when you process a 2D convolution, you don't need the whole frame to get started, right? You might, if you have a three by three kernel, for example, you might need three rows or, you know, if you do pooling, you need like maybe six or something, but you can get started with your first convolutions and you can produce the first output before you even have all of the input. And so we're using that system to avoid having buffers, intermediate buffers that are as big as the, number, the frame size times the channel size. And of course, nothing's ever free in life. So this comes with limitations for the network. So you cannot ever produce more than you consume because then you run out of memory again. And we're using that for some of our demos as well. So it works, but again, there are some limitations. So this is the device that we're talking about in this little cube camera with running on a battery and it's showing two of the examples that we implemented. On, go. Yeah, so we use these celebrities because they're much better looking than we are. But I think it brings across the point um, what you can do with this on a battery. So um, I want to prefix this with don't ever trust a benchmark that you haven't tuned yourself. Uh, you all know this. So this is our benchmark. We know our devices very, very well. We do not have in our lineup um, Cortex M7. So I, we would invite everybody to reproduce these benchmarks or make their own to match their own applications. But these show the two networks that were running inside the demo that we just showed, which the one is a keyword spotting thing that was the on and go. And the other one is the face ID. You can see in the table below the number of multiplier accumulates that these have. So they're not particularly big. I would say the face ID is a little less than half of the device capacity. So the one advantage of doing this all in hardware when compared to the Simpsys NN with the SIMD on an M4 or M7 device is that it's a lot of faster in terms of inference time. So we're running at 50 megahertz in this accelerator and the other guys run as fast as the chips do like 120 and 216 megahertz. But the real benefit comes when, it, when you look at energy and I made this chart not logarithmic on purpose because battery life is not logarithmic. So it's, it's kind of a joke that you can't see the max 78,000, but I assure you those numbers are real. Um, the 32650 is one of ours. It's an ultra low power micro. It has a lot of internal memory, so we can run both networks in there. On the M7 side, we had to 
run the face ID on a device with external SD RAM, which is a penalty. And I'm sure you could find an SD RAM that's a little better than what we're showing there. So I made it separate and hashed it. So if, even if you were to assume that the SD RAM power was zero, you can still see that there's a big difference in terms of energy. And I think this really shows why we made the chip. So we are a hardware company and we think we've delivered some pretty good hardware, but we shouldn't forget that software is so important in machine learning. It's my personal opinion, it's more important than the hardware almost. And our call to participation is really try to implement software that runs on this hardware, not on a Titan RTX with 24 gigabytes, but keep in mind the, hard, the hardware limitations of these small embedded devices and make software. And we think it'll have an effect that just multiplies. So you'll have the much better hardware energy and then you put on much better software and you, you'll have the product of the two. And that could be in a algorithmic way. For example, we have this big accelerator for, for convolution. So we don't do FFTs in the micro anymore. We use a conf 1D layers for that. But of course, if you were to do a proper model search, architecture search, that would really benefit us as well. So the development flow is, there's two, other than this talk, I think there's always only two kinds of experts. There's the one that do machine learning and the ones that to embed it. And so we try to keep that separate. So, our, and you can find all of that in our GitHub, which we'll have the link to in just a minute. The machine learning experts, we try to make it so that they understand what this is. So we support mostly PyTorch. There's also a TensorFlow version of it. It's standard training, uh, just like any flow that you would be used to. And we take the checkpoint file, or if, if you have to, the Onyx file, and then we create C code from that using our own tools. And that embedded C code, uh, you can then enrich with your input and output routines that you need to implement an actual embedded application that talks to something useful. All right, so thank you for the attention. Um, we have links here. All of our code is open on GitHub. And uh, I think Chris, it's yeah, so uh, you certainly go to our website or the GitHub for more information on these parts. Uh, you can see some of the hardware we're offering there to the right. The big board is available now. Uh, that cube you saw demo, we're working on a more public release of that uh, uh, later. And then that uh, other smaller prototyping board is uh, is very close to to release. So, and yeah, feel free to, to reach out to, to me or, or to any Maxim representative to, to try to learn more. Thank you, everyone. All right, thank you so much to both of you um, for this fantastic presentation. So we have time for a couple of questions. So um, I think the first question um, I'd like to ask is, um, what are the steps needed to convert a floating point pre-trained CNN to run on your CNN accelerator? Okay, so we kind of keep in mind the, the fact that we don't, won't have floating point in the target device. And we do some operations during training already, mostly clipping. But if you were to use only int8, in my experience, you could just do it post-training. Um, you just throw away the floating point and make integers out of it. Um, once you need to go below eight bits, uh, we need to do quantization aware training. That's just our experience. And I, I'm not gonna pretend I'm an expert in any of this because it's such a complicated and wide field, but in practice, that seems to work okay. Okay, thank you. Um, second question, are you using optimized math libraries like Gemlo, P or QNN pack, or are there any custom libraries for the hardware? No, the hardware is completely a hardware state machine. So I, I would say every bit is optimized. It has no software harmed in the making of the hardware. <laughs> Okay, fantastic. Um, so next question, how would you compare your accelerator versus ARM's U55, U65? 
I have not seen a hardware, an actual chip with that. Uh, we started way before them. So I'm sure there's advantages and downsides of both. One thing that I would wanna highlight is I think many people that will use the ARM accelerator will probably ask you to use external memory. And in our mind, that is very costly in terms of energy. Um, and uh, another question, what are the filter kernel sizes for um, CNS? One by one by one and three by three. Perfect. And one last question. Um, what does the JTAG scan chain look like? Um, do both CPUs sit on the same JTAG or different ones? Different ones. All right, fantastic. So um, we don't have time for any more questions. We have a couple. Um, I'll forward them over and uh, we can post some answers in the forums if there are any available. So thank you to everyone who answered questions. Um, and thank you again to our presenters from Maxim Integrated. Uh, so another big thanks to all of our sponsors, Deeplight, Kixo, Edge Impulse, which is the company I work for, Reality AI, Maxim Integrated, and SynthSense. If you're interested in sponsoring the TinyML Talks series, please reach out to betty at tinyml.org. Um, so here's some specific notes from our sponsors. So DeepLight, use AI to make other AI faster, smaller, and more power efficient. Edge Impulse, where I work, we have an amazing end-to-end -end workflow that starts with data ingestion, helps you um, train a model, figure out signal processing, and deploy that model to any type of um, embedded target. Maxim Integrated, who we saw speak earlier today, um, their new Max 78000 implements AI inferences at over 100 times lower energy than other embedded options. So now the edge can see and hear like never before. Kixo provide an auto ML platform for embedded AI um, that builds tiny ML solutions for the edge using sensor data. Reality AI provide a set of tools for developing edge AI tiny ML models for the smallest MCUs. And SynthSense builds ultra low power sensing and inference hardware for embedded mobile and edge devices. They design systems for real time, always on smart sensing for audio, vision, biosignals and more. And again, a big thanks to our strategic partner, Arm, who is helping support the Tiny ML Talks series. Um, again, if you'd like to sponsor, please reach out to betty at tinyml.org for more info. Our next talks are gonna be on Tuesday, November 10th from Esam Sabori at DeepLight and Alexander Samuelson from Imagimov. Same time, um, but Tuesday, November the 10th. If you are interested in presenting yourself, please contact us at talks at tinyml.org. And a final mention of our TinyML Asia session, which is gonna be November 16th to 19th um, of this year. Um, we currently have a call open for video posters. So these are five minute presentations and our abstract to do October 31st. Uh, the full program is available at tinyml.org slash Asia 2020. So thank you so much, everybody, for attending. And um, we'll look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks again to our speakers. And I hope you all have a great day.